Difficult to master and tough to obtain, Beef Wellington is the end of the end game. A solid challenge to anyone looking to master the ways of the chef and nightingale. And today, I'm going to show you all how to make a Wellington that would bring a tear to Gordon Ramsay's eye. So what's going on everyone, my name's Tenebris, and for this week's Farm in Nightingale, I had a goal in mind. What is the best maximum health you could get in a meal that is easy to mass produce? I started out trying out salads, then steaks, but then an excellent resource came up in the community made by Potato Peppy, a spreadsheet of all the various meals in the game. And even though there are a ton of great foods in the late game, Beef Wellington stands out as the best of the best when it comes to overall health games. Then came the hard part. How do we optimize this into a farm? And that's when everything started clicking. I found one of the best ingredients along the way and managed to whip up a Wellington that adds an insane 960 extra points of health, on top of really solid stats overall. It's a perfect combination with the sashimi that we whipped up last week. Though, unlike our farm from last week, this one requires a bit more effort to set up. So let's go through the ingredients I used to make this, then we'll get into farming and mass production. In total, you'll need one piece of meat, three lots of oil, one refined salt, one refined flour, one seasoning, one actual flour, and one shiitake mushroom per beef wellington. First, the easiest resource to acquire, wheat. You could get this in forest realms with a score of 1 to 158. But in my own findings, wheat is a lot more common in realms with a lower realm score. You could tell it out by being in its raw form, which is much more yellow than other pieces of grass, or in seed bags. These both are most common around set pieces and pre-made structures, and all you'll need are two pieces of wheat fiber to get your seeds started. Then, while you're searching for wheat, you can double up and search for shiitake mushrooms at the same time, as they spawn in forest biomes too, though these will only spawn in a realm score of 0 to 49. Telling apart the different mushrooms is a bit tough, but what you're looking for are the convex mushrooms. The concave ones will only give you normal mushrooms. You could turn mushrooms into seeds as well, so again, all you need is two shiitake mushrooms to get started. For our next ingredient, we'll be getting dahlias from the desert. You can tell them out as these small orange flowers. They're pretty common in deserts of all realm score, but yet again, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone by searching for dahlias while we look for the next ingredient. Next, we'll be seeking out a rather rare ingredient. So rare, it took me about 200 hours to actually find them. What you'll need are sanguine berries. These spawn in deserts and forests at a round score of 100 plus. But as they're so rare, you probably won't find them in a forest biome. There are just too many types of berries competing for space. So instead, we'll search for them in a desert, as they're the only type of berries to spawn in a desert biome as far as I know. You can find them most often around set pieces and pre-made structures. You'll be looking for bushes and bags of berries. A key thing I found out along the way, it seems these spawn most often in an herbarium desert, or at least that's where the odds are best. So you'll want to look for these in either a standard herbarium on extreme difficulty, or ascended herbarium realms on medium or higher to get that realm score. And again, you only need two berries to get started with seeds, which really helps for sanguine berries. Now for the more difficult resource to farm, salt. We need this in twofold for both seasoning and refined salt. The only way to gather a ton of salt right now is to go out to a desert realm and mine it by hand. The best spawns seem to be in the herbarium realm at medium difficulty, or a realm score of 50 on the dot. Ore and rock spawns don't respawn on returning to a realm though, so we'll have to work around things later on. You'll be looking for the white ore that has a mining score of 40. Each run nets you about 3 to 4 stacks of salt, and with good movement you can get this done in under a half hour. Get like 2 or 3 runs through a desert and you'll have enough salt to last a couple stacks of beef wellington. 
Then for our final ingredient of the recipe, the meat. For this, we'll be using humbaba meat from the Hunt Swamp Realms. You could choose either Ascended or Regular Hunt as the level doesn't change the quality of the meat you get from Humbaba. On Regular Hunt though, Humbaba will have less health, and you could push that health down even further by dropping the difficulty if you want to take it out in one simple shot and have very little risk. But unlike Salt, where we have to reset the realm, Humbaba will respawn every time you reload the realm or when defeated, so you can farm it on every visit, but that also locks us into the Swamp Hunt Realm for our final farm. Another key detail for Humbaba, sometimes more than one will spawn, but we'll talk more about that when we discuss farming next. So before we get to those farming tips, let's show you how to put this build together. You can use any build palette you'd like, but I personally like to build with the pagoda style, so we'll be making a sort of zen garden type setup. To start our build, we'll come to the edge of a swamp hunt realm to set up our build space. This is the flattest area in a swamp, though you will have to avoid the water as it's too deep to stand in in most cases. We'll first place crude foundations in the water. You won't see the foundation at first, so use R and the scroll wheel to get it above water level. Then you're going to place them six long. We'll then extend the platform by seven foundations. This is the furthest your character can reach horizontally with building. We'll do that twice to end up with a length of 13, so the final platform will be six by 13 or 78 tiles. Then we'll place down 6 rows of 25 planters, keeping them in straight lines. This build costs 3,736 raw wood and 3,642 raw stone to build in total outside all the exterior resources, so it might take a few days to gather the supplies. So next, we'll be starting the pagoda build itself, and to start with, we'll be placing a pavilion around the farming area. We'll take our foundation and extend it by one, then place a portal on the inner corner to line up our new set of foundations. This might take a couple of tries to set up properly, but the more you start to build with this approach, the easier it becomes. We're aiming for a bit of height between the two foundations to act as a sort of step down into the farming area. We'll be using the edge of the portal to raise our foundation and check how close we are to the next foundation. Once we find a decent spot, we'll start raising the foundation that we're placing and inching it closer to the portal to line things up neatly. We could then place our next foundation where we're planning to start, delete the old one, and move on to our second build. We'll take our new pagoda foundation and bring that around the edge of the crude foundations. For the walls, we'll go with pavilion walls, and we'll bring that around the inner edge of the pagoda foundations, ensuring they snap to the pagoda and not the crude foundation. We'll leave a gap at the front entrance, then bring pavilion walls around the back, and leave a gap here as well. Then we'll finish up the interior walls. For the exterior, we'll continue placing pavilion walls, but this time we'll only leave a gap of two at the front entrance. Then for roofing, we'll take the pagoda roof peaks and line them around the whole wall except for the corners. And lastly, for the pavilion, we'll place roof peak corners at the four corners of the build. Peak corners are a bit weird in the game right now, but as long as you're lining up that kind of upper roof, then you're placing them in the right direction. This is easiest to build in segments, so we'll show each total for each segment along the way for the pagoda build. For the pavilion, you'll need 298 ceramic, 231 carved wood, 84 gilded lumber, 126 shingles, and 84 paint. 
A nice thing for now is that the game has a hard time calculating materials for large builds, so you might wind up saving some resources along the way here. Now for another building tip. Some things will remain supported even when there's no foundation beneath them, stairs being a prime example. So we'll place down four foundations, then our stairs, then delete the foundations below the stairs before moving on to the floor for the main crafting area. For this, we'll want to make a foundation of 4x4, and then remove the two foundations at the front so that we can make a bit of a stairway leading in. This is what your foundation for the next segment will look like, again missing the upper two front foundations. And the cost of this part of the build is 186 ceramic, 4 gilded lumber, 4 carved wood, and 4 paint. We'll finish off the foundation with railings into the pavilion, and then the stairs at the front, which you'll have to place the bottom stairs first, then the next set leading in. These cost 12 carved wood, 10 paint, and 8 gilded lumber. For the walls of the pagoda house itself, we'll make the walls out of geometric windows, and we'll follow the outline of the foundations we laid down, leaving the front and back entrance empty so we can have a nice open feeling to this build. Then we'll place the roof, placing our corners first this time so we can build the rest of the angled roofs off of them. And for the peak, we'll place four corner roofs. Now lastly, for the interior, we'll start by bringing some upper floors above the entrance. This is primarily just for detail. We'll then place half gable ends, and then a railing in between them. And we'll create two small rooms by placing down door frames and then half gable ends on top of them. All in all, this build looks fancier than it costs, being only 78 gilded lumber, 36 carved wood, 70 paint, 36 ceramic, and lastly, 48 shingles. And then for a final exterior detail, we'll create little porches that you could detail if you'd like to. To do so, we'll place down three extra foundations with railings around the edges on either side. It's pretty hard to avoid the swamp water for this part, so you'll either want a high poison resistance like what I've got, or maybe place a fresh foundation to stand on and avoid the hassle I went through. This is the last piece of the structure, and it costs 36 ceramic, 24 carved wood, and 12 paint. With the main structure down, you now have a total vibe of a location to work in. So let's get on to the augments you'll need to make this hyper-efficient. We'll be making a ring of crafting stations in the middle, use one room for our bed, then you'll have the other room to decorate as you please. For crafting and furniture, we'll place down a calcularian stove, six excellent mortar and pestles, a table, storage in the utilitarian shelf, which I actually shrunk down from two shelves to just one shelf that I'll show you in a second here, and then a bed of your choosing in one of the rooms. I like the Art Nouveau myself. You'll definitely want to check the description for the list of resources needed here and for the augment section, as it's kinda all over the place and very specific. 
Now for augments, we're placing down Danu's Cauldron, which you get from the main quest line, the Meat Grinder, which you get from the Swamp Astrolab Trader, and then lastly, the Simple Plant Pot, which you get from the Forest Antiquarian Trader. Then we'll place down two mining safety lamps, or whatever standing light of your choice. This will give the well-lit bonus to all of the crafting stations. Now for storage. This is a great setup that isn't too heavy on resources, but offers a ton of space. And shoutouts to a commenter named Cadmus from my last farm for telling me this, but you could place two steamer trunks on the bottom of a utilitarian shelf. You can... Also go even further than that though, and stack up six from the bottom to the top. The top doesn't seem to place too easy, but I'm sure we'll find a way to get this all stacked up in the future. For now, this is perfect for a farm that uses a bunch of ingredients like this one. And with that, we are finally finished the build! You have your crafting area with all of the crafting times cut down to the lowest possible with just a few augments, a great storage system, and again, just an overall excellent spot to do all of this crafting at. And now it's finally time to get to some farming tips, where I've optimized this as well so you could get the most out of this endgame farm hunting Humbaba endlessly, and having all the salt you'll ever need in just a few steps. First, we're going to make this crop farm be at max production by bringing the foundation out so it's exposed. Then for planting, you'll want 50 seeds of sanguine berry, 50 seeds of wheat, 25 for dahlia, and 25 for shiitake. Though at times you might want to switch things around so you could get a good supply of dahlias. Then we're going to break up the work between us and our follower, removing any of their held items so they can path a bit easier to plant crops, and giving them half of the seeds. We're then going to automate watering and increase our crafted seeds by playing the farm card. You can get this from the Forest Hunt Trader. This also increases our plant growth to the maximum, so we don't need any lighting out here and again, will rain very frequently, keeping your crops watered. And for the final bit of farming advice, make yourself a watering can with the charm of bounty on it to increase plant yields even more. You may also need the watering can if the automated watering ever gets held up. With this setup, every time you craft a full stack of seeds, you'll get 300 in return, and with the optimal layout of augments and having your calcularian stove active, you can get these things crafted in no time, even bringing oil down to just 8 minutes of crafting. Though, you might want to do what I do and save oil crafting for the night, get that set up, and sleep to finish it all in bulk. Now for farming salt. This is where I'm going to introduce a way to use realms and portals to your benefit. This is called a burner realm. It's a realm you set to purposefully reset in order to get a specific resource. In this case, salt from a herbarium desert. We'll name our portal so we know what card to reset in the future, and I like to have an area for this in specific so I can keep my portals organized. But we've already had one massive build in today's video, so I'll leave this for a future idea. Then we'll head to the desert, fly around with the umbrella and dash, and mine all the salt we can find easily, then head out, reset, and do it all again. It's really easy and takes very little time to get a ton of salt. And if you want to go really crazy, then put Oberon's bounty on your pick of choice, and you'll get almost double the salt. It still can roll a low number as what you get is RNG, but it really makes a difference, turning what could be like 3 to 5 stacks a run up to around 8 stacks, which is why we use salt as our main spice in our beef wellington. And then finally hunting down Humbaba. For this, we'll use the track legend spell, as that will lead you to it the fastest. As well, currently in the game, Humbaba will respawn every time you hunt it, so after you're done skinning, then just recast Track Legend and find where Humbaba respawned. Sometimes though, Humbaba will spawn under the floor, so if that happens, just pop back to your respite, then back to the swamp to refresh its spawn. And as a final tip, 
Sometimes you'll get two Humbabas or more per realm. This again is just random chance, but if it ever happens, that really speeds up the process. You get 15 meat per harvest, so kill 10 of them and you've got a full stack of beef wellington. That's like a hundred hours of food, so have fun with a near infinite supply. Also, don't forget to pick up the wood, it will have dropped along the way, as you can use that to keep your stove fueled indefinitely. Then you'll take your sanguine berries and make oil, your dahlia and oil to make aromatic, your salt to make refined salt, which is both essential and acts as a spice, marinade, which uses more oil and that spice, and then the grindy part, wheat for dough, which again, you might want to change up your farm to focus on wheat for a bit to build up a decent supply. It's the wheat that's holding me back on making a huge craft here and getting a stack of beef wellington for the end of the video, but by the next video, you'll see the fruits of my labor here. For now, thank you very much for watching. This was a huge effort to figure out and make farmable, but I think this has also opened up tons of doors for late game farming that I look forward to expanding on. Either way, I hope you have fun putting together your own beef wellington farms. This is a big time sink, but it's a really solid one that I think is really rewarding in the end game of Nightingale. So, cheers everyone, and I will catch you all in the next one. Until then, peace.